relations professional, freelance magazine and internet writer, and public relations and advertising consultant. He earned his MS in journalism and PhD in mass communication from Ohio University. And he currently teaches at Keene State College in Keene, New Hampshire. So you must have had quite a journey here. I did. It was a beautiful trip this morning. It was wonderful. Okay. Well, Thank nice. you so much. I'm very happy to be here. And I'll update one thing. It's been so long since that was written. I now have 30 years of experience oh. <laughs> in the mass media. And as part of that today, I'm going to do what most journalists usually do, and that's tick you off. <laughs> or maybe inform you, but it's more likely to be the part to tick you off. Because we're talking about how journalists make decisions about moral issues. And it's a big problem for the field, and it's a big problem for me because I teach journalists uh, at my college how to do good ethical decision making. And uh, I can't lay claim to having taught a lot of them yet, but apparently we're not doing a very good job as a field. Because take a look at how journalists are typically rated. Yeah. Yeah. We've really got the car salesman beat. It doesn't surprise me we have congressmen beat whatsoever. Um, it's sad. And that's not a good thing for our country because we're absolutely dependent upon having an informed public to make a democracy work. And journalists are the people who are supposed to be doing this job. And if you don't trust them, which apparently a majority of people do not, then how can you believe anything they say? Then how can you be informed? How can we make good decisions? So I want to go ahead and talk about today about why journalists appear to be unethical sometimes, perhaps how they are unethical sometimes, and how they aren't. Because it's a big problem here. And it all comes down to, and I'm going to, how tight are you zooming on me? So I have a tendency to walk around. Just go ahead and do that. Okay. All right for that. I guess they're filming this, so uh, I'll try to stay in one spot to make it easier for the, uh, the cameraman. Our problem is, is that the way journalists interpret their role in society is different than how the public interprets their role in society. And that's a real problem because how you make an ethical decision depends upon what that role is and how the public will perceive the justice of that decision. And we've got this real mix right now about perceptions on what journalists think they should be doing, how they should behave, and how the public thinks they should behave. And in part because, uh, at least under my contention and how I think most journalists are taught, the public doesn't understand that there is a different professional morality that journalists must, and I'll repeat that, absolutely must take on if they're to do their job appropriately. And that professional morality here is very different than what I'll call the public morality. That is the sort of behavior, the rules, the ethical decisions that the average person makes on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have two clashing systems here. And a misunderstanding on part of the public about why journalists have this separate system. And I think a really bad job being done by journalists to explain the fact that they do have a separate professional set of moral rules. So obviously you're going to ask, well, what's the difference between these two senses of morality? Let me explain this public morality first here. Basically these are the sorts of traditions and cultural and even legal rules that we all typically abide by. We learn them from our parents, from schools, teachers, from clergy. Uh, also from the courts, okay? And uh, we're all expected to behave this way. Now, one of this big important tenets of this public morality is that you don't have to necessarily go out and behave like a super angel or a saint. We don't have to be Mother Teresa's. But we're expected to generally follow these rules, and if we can, 
act in an appropriate fashion. For example, we're all familiar right now of the Ebola outbreak in Africa. Yet, would we look down on any one of us because we're not over there helping those people? How come you're not over there helping us? We wouldn't. The public sense of morality is certainly I would help somebody if I found them falling down the stairs outside the library here. We would definitely look down at a person if you just kind of stepped over top of them and walked into my talk, as engrossing as it might be. Uh, <laughs> but we wouldn't look down on anyone else for not going to Africa. Now, this kind of thing varies greatly for journalists because as part of this professional morality here, you have a separate role-defined role differentiated set of moral rules that you absolutely must follow. You have an absolute obligation whether you agree with them or not from a personal sense of morality. You're expected to behave in a way that perhaps common ordinary morality would not advocate, admire, or even suggest it to be done this way. Okay. So again, a role-defined set of behaviors that you absolutely must do. Now, this comes, and the justification for this, and, and I hope we'll talk about this perhaps in the questions here, this comes in large part because of this responsibility that seems to be placed on journalists in the Constitution. It is the only business that receives constitutional protection in the First Amendment freedom of the press. And there is an expectation here that you're supposed to then provide this truthful, unbiased, comprehensive account of the day's events to educate the public about important issues and to act as a mirror for society, to hold up who we are as a people. And in particular, a big part of that is that watchdog role that we play with government as journalists. Now, while all of us will look at this and say, yeah, that makes perfect sense, we're not so sure about this professional sense of morality because it's a poorly defined role compared to most other professions as we would think of them. And I'll explain those professions, but even those ones that we do understand it, such as, for example, a doctor, a member of the clergy, a lawyer, even for those professions, we don't always get the idea that they have a separate set of professional standards of rules they must follow. And I'll give you the perfect example. How many lawyer jokes do you know or have heard in your life? I'm not good at remembering them, but I remember uh, laughing at a lot of lawyer jokes. We know that they're supposed to represent the guilty in court. Yet, how many of us don't feel some sense of anger when they get a guilty person off? Okay. Their job is to represent the person. To, in particular, to make sure that the state proves its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Even if that means letting the pedophile go free. The hope is, is that by all defense attorneys and prosecutors living up to their professional obligation. In the long run, we will have a system which ensures that innocent people do not go to jail. And we actually, as part of that, would say it's probably better to let lots of guilty people go free than it is to imprison a single innocent person. That's part of that professional standard. Yet we really hate that attorney. Now certainly we know there are attorneys, defense attorneys in particular, who commit pretty egregious acts in defense of uh, guilty people. But for the most part, they're behaving in very logical, role-appropriate, role-defined, and role-required ways. And if they don't behave that way, they'll be disbarred. They will lose their license from that. So, we don't even accept that with attorneys. We kind of get the fact that doctors are going to hurt us sometimes to help us get better. For example, to cut our stomachs open to take out a bad appendix. We get that part. But still, we're not so pleased about doctors a lot of the times either. I'm paying you a lot of money for a service I really don't want. And by the way, I don't feel very good along the process here. <laughs> okay. okay. So here along comes journalists who we don't even recognize as a general, of having perhaps a separate set of role-defined rules 
to follow. And this leaves us with all sorts of problems and misunderstandings. And I'll take and try to illustrate what I'm talking about with that here by going through some case studies here uh, concerning just a couple issues. Um, let me, actually, let me pause now. I, I do Q&A at the end, but this is not a bad time to take a break. Do you have any questions about what I mean by the sense of public morality versus professional morality? Please, ma'am. Um, could you give us an example of how professional morality might conflict with public morality? I understand. Okay, all right. I'm going to do that right, okay, the question was, can I give an example of the difference between the two? I'm going to do that in, in the case studies here in just one second. So I'll pass that one off. Sir? Is there a professional order of journalists? That's a really great question. Is there a professional sort of association or an order that oversees this? And this is one of the problems, too. In the classic professions, clergy, doctors, attorneys, they have very formal associations, which you have to apply to to become a member of, to take the bar exam, to take a medical licensing board review. And if you don't live up to those standards, you can't be one of them. The same thing for some clergy, not all denominations, but the Catholic uh, priests, for example, they have to go through seminary school and graduate to become a priest. Journalists don't have that. And it's probably a good thing that they don't because who do you really want to be in charge of that? The government? We don't want the government saying, you can be a journalist, but you can't. So we've got a problem there. And the same thing, another big difference here too is, is if a physician violates the rules of their profession morally, you lose your job. That doesn't exist here in journalism. There's no formal agreed upon study in the profession of journalism. You don't have to go to college to get a degree to have a class with me, to be a journalist. Anyone can be a journalist. Not true of the other professions. Although sometimes with the clergy that is the case. Uh, but traditionally, so there's some real differences in, and you've hit upon a point as to why it seems like it's not a profession. The one thing that I will justify to say that qualifies it as a profession is that it is entirely like medicine, like law, like clergy. It's not aimed at the advancement of the individual or of an organization. It's, it shouldn't be anyways. It's supposedly aimed entirely at serving the public. That's how journalists will say, I'm like a profession even though I don't have the same kind of standards. All right. Let's answer the other question you have, which was perfect, so we'll, so we'll illustrate this out here. First, let's talk about privacy. How would you feel if you looked in today's paper and there was a listing that you were arrested for DUI? And perhaps, it's an, in this case, let's throw out this hypothetical. It's true. You were arrested for DUI. How are you going to feel about having that in the paper? How would you feel if it was something worse, that you've been charged with rape or sexual assault or really any sort of crime here? Especially if it's true that you've been charged, but it's not true that you did it. Nobody likes that. Yet, this is something that journalists do every day. And I've had it suggested to me by many times, uh, wouldn't it be better if journalists didn't announce these kinds of things, which feel like an invasion of privacy, and instead wait till somebody was actually convicted, and then mention it? Because then we would protect the innocent, there wouldn't be the sort of embarrassment, the stigma that could be attached to those sorts of things. And I, I fear about this all the time as a professor. I'm working with a lot of young women. Oh my God. For anyone to even accuse me of any impropriety that way is going to kill my career, especially when it goes into the newspaper. Yeah. So how would you feel then if journalists were to behave more like the rest of us what we would say, let's not invade people's privacy here, and we're only going to print this story when you're convicted. Does that sound like a reasonable sort of behavior for journalists? Okay. And according to the public sense of morality, 
we would certainly follow along with that logic. However, the professional sense of morality comes along and says, look, your job is to provide a truthful, accurate, comprehensive, unbiased account of the day's events and to serve as a watchdog for government. I've just had the state take an action against a person to accuse them of a crime, to initiate a legal government proceeding. I have an absolute duty to report this. And I'm doing it not to embarrass this person. I'm doing it not to defame them or put their reputation under question. I'm doing this as a profession because my job is to serve as a watchdog of the government's behavior. Imagine a police officer suddenly walking into here and sticking the president of your organization in handcuffs and walking out. <laughs> What happened? I don't know. Police officer, what happened? Official police business. Off they go. There's nothing in the paper. You don't, you don't hear from her for six months, eight months. I mean, it takes forever for a trial to happen these days. And then all of a sudden, you're out, and there's a story in the paper that says, we charged this person with this crime, and they were found to be innocent. We have no idea how to keep track of what's happening in those sorts of situations. And could you imagine the potential for abuse by the police, by, do you call them county attorneys or district attorneys in Vermont? State's attorneys. State. State's attorneys. So you have a, a state attorney for each county? Okay, everyone, that's interesting. Okay. Imagine the potential for abuse there without that sort of governmental watchdog kind of situation here. Unfortunately, that means reputations can be hurt. On the other hand, a journalist might argue by doing my duty, by reporting the actions every day, in the long run, I may well take and enhance public information and prevent the abuse of power by those in powerful positions. Question? Uh, yes, sir. Abusing the power of, not abusing the power of the people, but leading the people, knowing that the people will often go overboard and think that because she's been accused, she is guilty, right. still proven innocent. Isn't the journalist kind of helping that whole pro negative process along and therefore assisting, working against social good? Yeah. It's a good question, and I suppose it comes down to the philosophy if um, who's responsible for their actions and who isn't. But the, but the journalist is, is leading the public on. No, they're saying only that this person has been accused of this. Yeah, but the journalist knows darn well that the uh -huh. people will not read the, what's said there, but will read the implication that possibly and probably she is guilty. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. I, I get. I I agree with you, and this does absolutely happen, especially when it comes to things like about sexual assaults and so forth. This person's reputation is ruined. I don't think that we can ever blame a journalist for reporting the truth if somebody else misinterprets the truth and applies it in the wrong way. That's like with you as former teachers for you reporting. Uh, any history teachers here? You tell your students about what the Nazis did to the Jews during World War II and why they said they did these things and all of a sudden your student goes out and starts killing Jews. Are you responsible for that as a teacher? I don't think you can ever blame the teacher for that and that is where I would say the journalist serves the same role as an educator in this sort of event. And just as we would not blame the teacher there, we could not logically blame the journalist here. Should the journalist be, you would? That's okay. Oh, would. Sure. Ta let's take it a step further. I don't know if you want to. Oh, no, no, no. This is great. We'll take it a step let's further. Let's take it a step further. And let's suppose there's a racial situation. Sure. And the journalist has some information that he knows, or she knows, that will inflame the whole situation. Mm -hmm. Should that be published? Should the journalist say that inf that's information and therefore knowledge, uh, not, 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 yet, not yet knowledge, information, 
and society needs to know about that, knowing darn well that that will inflame the situation and lead to, to racial strife and Lord knows what. Okay. I think we'll come back and it's sort of the same thing again. Um, if the journalist is releasing information that truly is relevant to the knowledge of the people, that it bears some significance to what we're supposed to know to operate in a democratic society, then they cannot be held responsible for the actions of ignorant others who would twist that information. And in both cases, I say you're telling journalists not to do their job because there are stupid people in the world. I know, but I'm, I, I guess I would teach my journalists, you cannot be concerned about that. And I'll give you an example why when we get through some of the rest of these. And we'll come back to it, because these are great questions, and they're the same ones my students ask. Yes, ma'am. Um, so my concern is that journalists are making choices all the time. Absolutely. What, what to, uh, present. They're making choices all the time, yes. I wonder how that plays out with what we see in the paper, because I think um, if people were better informed, that that would, you know, I mean, when, when you hear you hear this person was arrested for this and such, but then when you read, there's always a much a much bigger picture that may not be. Okay, so the the question, and I'm repeating this for the camera, so uh, this can be picked up. Uh, in the case of race, for example, with arrests by police and so forth, people of color arrested far more often, convicted more often, abused by police and so forth, yet we don't see that story. We just see the arrest report. And here's where I will say journalists are failing to tell the whole story. The only thing they're doing is reporting the day's event. A black man was arrested. They're not doing the educational story that talks about exactly the things you're talking about, that blacks are disproportionately arrested by crime, et cetera, et cetera. And it's sort of the same thing here. We might report this thing which is going to cause excitement in the community and perhaps have hothead sprawl. Well, the journalist also has a duty to do other stories to explain these sorts of situations, too. And, and maybe that would be my correction, rather than to hide the truth, Let's go ahead and educate the public so they don't do dumb things. Okay, let me jump on to the next part here. Uh, this was from about 10 years ago when we first got involved in the Gulf and we think about invasions of privacy here. This was a case where a news photographer was actually permitted, asked the family's permission to come take pictures of the funeral. And the photo ended up on the page. Now, if somebody gives permission from this, it can't truly be an invasion of privacy, but was the public fully aware of perhaps how this picture might be viewed when it was on the front page? Typically, we don't think of personal information getting out to large amounts of people as being a good thing. Because what do we call those folks who tell everyone about other people's private information? They're gossips. We shun them in the public sense of morality. Yet journalists are supposed to be, to some extent, gossips. Justified gossips. And whether they're given permission or not to invade moments, like this, or to at least be part of a moment like this, the professional obligation is, is that you need to mirror the society that you're in. You need to show the impact of stories. And sometimes an argument can be made, perhaps unjustifiably, but at least this is part of the sense of professional duty. An argument can be made is that I need to cause some pain to some people to truly show the world what this situation is like. And that may well mean I'm going to hurt people for a greater good. And this is where we can certainly start to disagree about where the greater good comes about and is the journalist justified. But there's a sense of that, that I am going to publish this story that might inflame racist sentiments because I'm hoping in the long run people will understand racism better. Perhaps we'll actually stop, uh, start to fight it and to take action. 
And it's a hard process. It's the same thing. That attorney gets the pedophile off. We don't like it. We understand a little bit why they do that so that in the long run the whole justice system works the way it's supposed to. You may not like it, but this is why journalists do this type of privacy thing. Sometimes it gets to this thing kind of offensiveness if we go back to 9-11. Could we really have a sense of what was happening there in the towers that day unless we were seeing some of the video, including some of this horrendous stuff? Now, I'm not advocating, let's show this 24-7, the same loop of video of people falling to their death. I'm not even advocating showing it very often at all. But when it's live and it's happening now, a journalist has a professional obligation to show you what is happening, even if it's offensive as hell. Even if it means some kid is at home, my daddy works there, that could be him falling. Even if that pain happens, it needs to happen. We would never want anyone who wasn't part of a profession to be that incredibly offensive and perhaps insensitive to the feelings of others. But as a journalist, part of the profession, the idea is we take on this obligation and we make decisions which you might hate because we believe it serves a purpose, that this would mirror society in a way that would be valuable. Now, to come back to your question about inflaming sentiment, I would argue that stuff like this actually probably inflamed the country to take actions that it didn't need to take. In part because we saw this and reacted so viscerally to it. Okay? It can have negative impact. Hopefully, in the long run, it won't. Hopefully, getting that pedophile off now means that we never imprison innocent people. Sticking kind of with a war theme here, um, we have saw many instances here in the last 10 years since the war on terror began of looking at problems with how the public perceives the press's coverage of war. In fact, that this is a, a thing here which is highly controversial, I would argue as do many others who teach ethics in journalism, that journalists know, owe zero loyalty to their country. Your loyalty can only be to truth, to that unbiased, comprehensive, educational, mirroring type of story. And it may well mean that if you're going to fulfill your duties, you're going to do something which everyone else is going to look at you and go, you heartless bastard. For example, and I often start the, the, this talk this way by saying, imagine being with some uh, Marines. We get sent back into Afghanistan, which they're talking about here. And you're with a, a, a crew of Marines and walking into a town, and you're at the tail end, and you happen to see some uh, ISIS fighters setting up an ambush on the Marines. You're a journalist. What do you do? Do you warn the guys you're with and roll film? Do you just roll film or do you run? What do you want to do? <laughs> well, we know the professional <laughs> run was the answer. That's exactly what I want to do, actually, which is why I'll never be a foreign correspondent because I don't want to get killed over something like that. Okay? I was a Marine, but at least there I had a rifle. Okay. Uh, you can't run then, you know, if you're going to do your job. Now, the other two choices, which are you comfortable with? Just rolling film and reporting the truth as it happens? Or do you warn the Marines? Okay. That's the public morality, and that would be the appropriate call. For a journalist, it is absolutely, positively the wrong thing to do. Absolutely, positively, you cannot be unbiased, if you are taking part in an event of this magnitude. Wow. But you're with Americans. That's right. But you're not an American. You're a journalist. And you cannot be an American ever as a journalist. You can only be a journalist. That is part of the professional duty and obligation. And you have to knowingly and willingly give up 
the Americanness to be a journalist. It's a problem because it may well mean the deaths of all those Marines, your countrymen. It may well mean, as you know, your own death as you're captured by them. Why then would you do that? Why would you perhaps sacrifice yourself and watch, and, and as far as I'm concerned, and this is my person, I believe ISIS is evil. I, I don't mean bad guys, evil. To me, evil is a ideology that says, if you don't believe like me, I kill you. And that's exactly how extreme this group is. That's, that's Hitler. It cannot get any worse than that. Thought is as bad as action in their mind. I don't care what somebody believes, how crazy, as long as you don't act on it and hurt somebody else. These people are like that. Okay, so I have no feelings for them whatsoever. They're evil. They're wrong. I don't care if they get killed at all. On the other hand, you cannot do your job if you start to take sides. How can you ever be seen as objective by people from other cultures or from even your readers if you take a side? Well, maybe we're happy when they side with us, but how do I know when you are and aren't siding? And I'll give you an example of why journalists do this and the dangers of taking sides. I'll explain this thing in a second here. Oh, I don't have it. Oh, I thought I had the picture here. Um, we've had a few history folks here, but we've all had enough history lessons to know. Remember uh, the Civil War? What was happening with... <laughs> what? <laughs> I forgot, I'm not talking to 18 and 19 year olds. What? <laughs> what was going on the first year or so, or two years, in regards to who was winning? South was kicking the Norris butt royally. Why? A little louder, please. In large parts, but it wasn't just that. It was also better tactics, wasn't it? The Union loved to stand its troops up in the field and march them across open areas to fortified positions, people hiding behind walls, fences, et cetera, et cetera. I'm trying to think of Bull Run what was it, like 15,000 dead or something like that? Uh, all of those battles, we, you know, we saw tens of thousands of Union troops being slaughtered in really ridiculous ways. No reports of that ever got to Washington or to the general peop people because the journalists were partisan. They took sides. The northern reporters said, our troops today made a valiant... Uh, tactical withdraw. Other words, they ran like hell. Okay. They fought a valiant battle. They never said what actually was happening. They stood up, marched across the field towards people who could not be hit by them and were slaughtered by the thousands. They took sides. As a result, the North never knew what was going on. Lincoln didn't have much of a clue about the absolute incompetency of the generals who were still fighting Napoleonic War style battles. It's a problem when the truth isn't out there. And things get really bad, even worse than when the truth is out. I'll take the ramifications of a few nuts who are gonna misunderstand something I wrote well over than I will take a entire country or several states that is, doesn't know what's even happening, to even to begin to rationally approach a problem. It's just to give you a quick thing, remember here uh, when we got into this whole thing in the Middle East, our troops were over there and a lot of them were showing up, they didn't even have body armor. Their Humvees were not armored. And guess what? 
we found out about it, didn't we? And what happened, especially uh, after the press got on to the Bush administration and Cheney's remarks about, well, you fight the war that you have, not one you wish, you know, his remarks, they weren't making it with the American public. We demanded, get these guys body armor, get them armored vehicles, and they got it. Now, if we go back to World War II, that would have never been reported. And it wasn't because the journalists were actually in uniform wearing American uniforms, only speaking the line that was authorized by the military and which they thought would promote morale and not hurt the war effort. That kind of effort, reporting our troops don't have the things they need, would have never been reported in World War II. And if you read through much of the information from that, very little got reported and a lot of incompetency kept going on and on forever because people were not aware of it. Yes? It's a good one. The, the question was, the perception already is that we don't get the full truth. And, you know, um, I would have to agree with you, we don't, it, from broadcast anyways. Uh, it's become miserable because not only are these journalists, and, and I'll say that with the exception, I would say, in the United States anyways, with the exception probably of public radio and television, there is no broadcast journalism left in America at all. It's worthless. CNN, Fox, MSNBC, you name it, it's worthless. They're not doing their job at all. They've, uh, they've all become prostitutes. As far as I'm concerned, Wolf Blitzer should be wearing a miniskirt and high heels as he does that, and standing on a corner somewhere rather than on the TV set as he feeds this crap to us so his network can make money. It's a tough job because, one, you do have to make money to stay in business. It's a tough job because it could cost you your life to do it. It could certainly cost you friends. And it will cost you personal agony because sometimes you will hurt people and must hurt them if you're going to do your job well. kind of pretty much cover this here. If you think this is a new thing, think again. Read this quote from John Adams here. If we think the difference between Fox News and MSNBC is dramatic, go back and read the press for the first, actually up until the, the, the 1950s. Journalists and news media organizations were incredibly partisan and even worse than they are today. The sad part is, is that in bits and pieces we're probably seeing some of the finest journalism that's ever, ever been done in large part because the internet and modern technologies has made it possible to get information quickly and more easily than ever before. But unfortunately, it's all being uh, overshadowed by people uh, who have given more concern to making money than to doing the profession. Okay, I'll take in and open it up uh, to questions here now, because and I leave plenty of time for this, because I know this is one of those topics that makes people go, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> what about that? What about it? So hit me. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll come back to you real quick because you, you were definitely advocating for journalists to take more of a concern in a way which I said they cannot be concerned about. You want me to go ahead? Yeah, please. Okay. I, I'd like to take your, your platoon case. Sure. The, the okay, about the platoon case here. He's the, the enemy up above that right. the platoon doesn't see. Right. Sure. The journalist does nothing, they just film and let it happen. Yep. Let me, let me bring that uh, one step further and suppose a uh, different situation but the same kind of issue. Suppose a journalist is interviewing the enemy at some point, we allow him to interview, and he learns that a whole village of 50,000 people, not 50,000, let's say 2,000 people, 
is going to be attacked and wiped out the next day. Okay. Does that journalist have a moral obligation to warn the village, or does he just set up his film crews around the village? Okay, so the question was, in, in a similar circumstances, let's say you're with the ISIS forces this time now. By the way, if you're with ISIS, you wouldn't warn them either that the Marines were about to attack them. You're a neutral observer. In a situation like this, this one, it's a great question. It gets kind of tricky. In the United States, it's generally accepted that while journalists do not have a loyalty to country, they do have to follow the laws of their own country. So, for example, uh, Geraldo Rivera got kicked out of Iraq because during a live TV thing, he got down in the sand on his knees, I have a picture of it, and drew a picture of the village and drew a line in the sand on how the American forces were going to attack. It's treason <laughs> to do something like that. Uh, and in this case, you might argue uh, you wouldn't be committing treason, or would you be committing treason to not mention that to American forces? Possibly? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm not or you're talking about the loyalty, perhaps, to the people there? No, not, not, not the loyalty issue at all, but just the saving of lives. It, yeah. it doesn't matter who's, who's doing what to who, it's just the idea that the village isn't warned, be it sure. American or, or IC or whatever village, they're going to, uh, 2,000 innocent children and, and people are going to be dying right. uh, because the journalist just wants to report, doesn't want to intervene in the war. Sure. Yeah. Well, the journalist is hopefully uh, is saying, uh, I'm going to repeat yeah, this again knowledge. for the camera. The journalist, has, the journalist has foreknowledge of an attack in which yeah. 2,000 people, otherwise innocent, might die. Do they take an active role in warning them like that? Or do, I just film? Or do they just film? Let me take and have you guys answer that question. The public sense of morality, no-brainer. Right. You protect the people. Yeah. What do you think for the journalists? How would you take it, given what I've told you? And maybe you don't agree with it, but what do you think the journalists should do here? Well, write the story and send it to the village. It's, it's obvious. Click. <laughs> yeah. Do both. It's a kind of an interesting thing, and here, and I would ask, this is the problem with hypothetical ethical questions. We don't always have all of the pieces here. I would want to know, so you're the ISIS leader, I'm talking to you. Are we on the record? Meaning, whatever you tell me is free for publication, or are you telling me this off the record? Meaning, I can't use it, I have to pretend that I've never heard it. It's that one? Oh, I don't know. Well, see, that, that's, that's how journalists make sure they don't get in situations like this, if they're behaving appropriately. You say to your person, look, anything you tell me now is on the record, and I will disclose it. Or, it's on deep background or off the record. Let me, let me bring mm -hmm. up another similar sure. case. Let's suppose there's a journalist and there's about to be a killing, public execution. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of journalists that are going to be killed by the should the journalist put down his camera and attempt to save the victim? Or should the journalist just film the event? Let me see, let me see if I can find one here that might illustrate this point very well. And I'm taking a chance that I can get a connection. I had one before. I do, oh great, great, this is cool. I love it when technology works. <laughs> and I bet you're familiar with this case. You may well be. Come on, come on. Make it work. <laughs> I'm too excited for this. Okay. Um, Wow. Images, please be there. Come on. Not too long ago, there it is, a journalist in Africa, photojournalist, was covering, and I'm ashamed to say, I don't recall. No. 
I get to get a, I get the one I can make this other image a lot larger. Hang with me a second here. I apologize. A journalist was in Africa covering a famine. He was traveling down the road, and there were people trying to get to a uh, food distribution center miles down the road. Lots of people, and many of them were not going to make it. They were already on the side of the road and dying, including. And we'll do it in black and white just because we don't need it in color. This young girl. Great. How do I kill that front light? Aha. Well, let's see this in all its splendor. The journalist took pictures, got back in the Jeep, and left. Sent the photo in, and won awards for it. What do you think the public outcry of his behavior was? You heartless bastard. How could you not help this child? The journalist later killed himself. Which is a shame, because he was doing his professional duty and in this case, it's kind of that thing. How do we know when to step into a story and when not to? It's one thing for you to be, I'm out taking pictures on the street one day and a young kid goes to walk across the street right in front of me, right in front of a car. As a journalist, it would never be proper for you to just let the kid get died and take pictures. You would grab them because that story serves no purpose. This story potentially does. And here's the other thing too. He's passing hundreds of people, many of them dying on the side of the road. How does he morally choose who to save? I've only got one Jeep. How many can I save? It gets very challenging here. And in a sort of situation here like this, it's different than the Marine unit. Because by taking sides there, you definitely show to the people of the world that you are a partisan. And ISIS is going to, they already hate journalists. They're going to hate journalists even more and be justified in killing them even more as spies, not on our side, if you take action. If you don't, you may still die. However, in the long run, both sides might get a feeling, wow, that American journalist didn't warn the Marines. Maybe he is trying to be neutral. And maybe, and it's a big maybe, in the long run, perhaps people will see journalists as serving professionals who are not partisan or particularly loyal. I don't know how this situation of not helping a single child here helps with the story. It doesn't. But if you've got hundreds of dying people, what do you do as a journalist there? I don't know. I don't want to be in this situation. Why? I'll never go there. Yes, sir? Another problem with the situation is it's not clear that journalists could actually even help this is true. And that, that's different from the child that's running across the street. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and these are the sorts of situations that you have to make up all the time. Uh, you have to decide upon. It's a challenging profession because of that kind of thing. What other questions? I didn't want to get it too far derailed. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't derailed. We just went in a different, but a critical direction. I think you've got the great questions, and they're the most important ones here. What do you mean you don't take a side when it seems like it is the morally right thing to do? But remember, professions are not required to do the things that we think are right. They're, provide, they're required to behave according to the professional codes. Well, and hopefully those professional codes align with society's yeah. ideals. But you see, uh, journalists like other professionals are also and they make mistakes. And They're human beings and they do make mistakes. I agree. Oh, 
Uh, so you said how it, it's challenging for journalists to live with the professional obligation if sometimes. They, it if is. They transgress their human morality yeah. as opposed to their professional morality. Because they are human and therefore they have, in addition to being a journalist, they also have an obligation towards their own humanity. It's absolutely, and it works both ways because you can imagine how the journalist felt who covered the buildup to the Iraq War. Their poor coverage, their lack of uh, investigation into claims, into information that was clearly available and open to many people, their, to counteract what the government, our government had been putting out, actually led us in, helped lead us into a war that could have been avoided. Their inaction there led to perhaps unnecessary deaths of hundreds of thousands of people and the maiming of many others and the expenditures of billions of dollars that might have been used in better ways. So this is the tough part about being a journalist is that inaction can be as bad as action. You can't predict the future. You can only hope that you're thinking this through clearly and playing these odds and then sit back and take the fact that the general public is not going to see it the same way you do on these tough ones because their sense of what is moral is clearly different than what your profession says it is. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm thinking in turn, uh, not quite as drastic as this picture, but I'm thinking of Dan Rather and his career and uh, I think you disciplined your own. Yeah, and they did there, absolutely. Uh, and that's kind of the hope. Okay, and the, the question was, is uh, Dan Rather, how his career ended? Uh, concerning coverage of Bush's uh, alleged lack of uh, participation as a National Guard soldier. Uh, it just a quick reminder, um, he got in trouble because one of the documents that he used to, as evidence to show that he wasn't doing his actual job, ended up being a forgery. The sad part was is that all the information was correct. All of it. The document itself was a fake to support that same information. He took the blame for it, and he should have for that. And we, and we came down and nailed him. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. Uh, Geraldo Rivera, for example, who <coughs> committed a, a, an act of treason, was not disciplined for it. Matter of fact, he still has a show. That was his second offense in Iraq. His first one was to pretend he was at a battle in Tora Bora. He pretended it a day or two after and 400 miles away. He filmed a stand-up. That's the part where you said, hi, I'm Mark Timney on the scene, you know, except he's laying on the ground because bullets are flying overhead, except it was days after the event and 400 miles away. It doesn't always happen. And this is where we need to come forward in this. And actually, uh, even more importantly, it's where you need to come forward. When you see bad journalism, turn it off. Don't read it. Refuse to watch it. News is a business. If I'm selling you jeans that fall apart and don't fit, you don't buy them. And as a result, as a manufacturer, I go, hmm, I better change this product or go out of business. Right now, our biggest problem, besides having journalists who aren't doing their job well, is a public that's willing to sit there and accept crap complete and total crap and still watch it. And I don't know how, it's a chicken and egg, which comes first here? Because if you guys are eating the crap up, we're gonna give you more crap. As one news director once told me, you know, if uh, you got a Coliseum crowd, a Coliseum crowd, somebody's gonna give you gladiators. <laughs> and that's what we've got on television news right now. In the back, sir. Ooh. <laughs> What's your local paper cost here for an edition? Is it like a buck? Here's a dollar. I want you to tell me everything that's going on in the world right now and get it damn, at, damn straight. <laughs> that's what we're asking. You're paying a dollar for that paper and demanding a heck of a lot. You're watching TV, 
with it's at least over antennas, if anyone still has those, whatever they are, it really only costs you the, the nickel for the electricity for the day there. Uh, we've reached this model here where news is driven by advertising. And as a result of that, we don't want to pay for it. And we're willing to sit through the ads to get crap. So where do we get the source? Who do you go to? For me, the only, I mean, <laughs> I got to say it. I go back to, to National Public Radio. That's the only broadcasting I listen to. I don't watch much television anymore. I cannot watch any of the television news because I will shoot my TV set <laughs> with inside of five minutes out of anger. And, or I'll be sitting there weeping, <laughs> you know, for hours. Such as, can you give me an example? Well, it's, a, it's an online uh, digest of... Right. Is this an actual website itself? I, I'm not familiar with it to even, uh, to even know. You know. I can't take Time or Newsweek anymore. They both seem to have too much of a biased standpoint. So this is where I read Frank Rich and people the New York Times. And Chris Hedges is... Okay, I'll check, th I'll check them out to, to, for something like that, but I'm not sure who you go to anymore. The New York Times used to be the paper, and I, for me it used to be the paper that, while it certainly has particular leanings in the editorial side, I thought it did a reasonably decent job in its coverage. That's faded a lot, in part not so much that they've gotten worse, it's just that they don't have the resources they used to and they're not doing the job that they used to because they don't have the staff. They lay so people off. Reader supported news, okay. Sure. So it's a public model just like NPR. Uh, can, can I, if you'll excuse me if I grab from uh, a couple other people. Yes, sir. <coughs> A documentary that might be of interest that would go to some of your questions is a documentary on James Nockway. James Nockway documentary, okay. And it's called War Photographer. And if you don't know of Nockway, he's probably the preeminent uh, war photographer, famine photographer uh, of our time. And a lot of the pictures that you would recognize would be would have been taken by Nockway. And this is really a, a study of how do you feel about what you do and why do you do it. Uh, and Nakwe is an eloquent spokesman for telling the truth, okay. uh, what is the greater good, and what is my role in it. It's a compelling documentary. I'm sure it's available on uh, DVD. But Nakwe, uh, if you follow contemporary photojournalism, uh, is at at the yeah, top of for that. people who are respected for it. I've, I've done, uh, you said war photographer, I've done talks on, on war and, and journalism. And, and it, journalism yeah. As a Montgomery fellow. It's one of those areas where, where the photographers have really failed miserably. We need, the, the picture we had up here about famine, we need pictures like that about war. Because we still live in the John Wayne days of war is glorious and what a wonderful thing and you know, we don't know it for the awful thing it truly is. And why we can show dead enemy soldiers, but not our own, it really makes me wonder, do we have a sense of the cost that is paid? And it's not that I'm against war. Uh, I think there's sometimes it's, it has to be done. Uh, I would prefer not to. Uh, but we seem to be ignorant of the cost because journalists have taken aside. I don't want to offend the sensibilities of my readers because it might cost me advertisers and, and an audience. Yes, ma'am. What I hear is that the government has certain rules about what can be shown. Is that true regarding war? No. Uh, it has certain rules about your participation as an embedded reporter, which you have to agree to, but they cannot limit on what you say. The First Amendment forbids it. Huh? No, they could. Sh no, they can't. It, to be an embedded reporter right now, the thing that you had to agree was that whatever story I do, I just have to show them what I'm going to do and talk with them about it. But they could not censor it or limit it. The only time that comes into play is if you start to commit treasonous types, types of acts, such as publishing the dates that the ships are sailing or when the attack will take place, that kind of things. That's the only time they can take action against you in regard to that. 
So those, those actual national security ones. Yes, ma'am. Joe Wilson. How so? Well, like we tried to bring to light the fallacies that were being perpetrated, and he got clobbered. Sure. His wife did too. Yeah. You know, Journalists did a really bad job of, of covering all of this. You have a, you have a um, government that's going after this. Sure. Like you know, and so when you say, you know, journalists aren't doing their job, there's a, you know, they want to do it, but there's also that concern about being prosecuted. It's, it's why it's one of the hardest jobs in the world at that level. It's because you have no friends, nor can you have friends. Well, look at Nixon's yeah. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's not a friendly place to be in, and I would never in a million years want to be in a war zone or a famine zone, because I don't want to pass that girl by. I don't want to not tell the Marines, you know. Uh, on the other hand, if there's an incompetent leadership there, I'm going to tell my readers that the lieutenants leading the platoons are incompetent. I don't care if that hurts the war effort. I'm going to tell the truth on that, because in the long run, it's better for everyone involved. Uh, yes, sir. John Stewart as a watchdog. <laughs> the sad part is, is that he probably does a better watchdog aspect, and at least of awareness, than many journalists do today. Would I call him a journalist? No. Nor does he call himself a journalist and refuses. Says, no, no, please don't take me that way. I'm a comedian. Uh, but dang. He hits it really well. And I wish more journalists would do what he does. And, and in my favorite parts, and you've all seen, I assume everybody's probably watched The Daily Show here. I love it when he says, today politician A said X. Wow, let's see what he said about that subject six months ago, and then a year ago. And you just see this back and forth, total flip-flops. <laughs> Journalists are forgetting that duty of educating, and right now they serve often as simple mouthpieces. Today, so-and-so said this, and the Republicans said that, and the Democrats said that. That's not educating. Um, that's just the here's the day's events thing. And that's part of that professional obligation. They're failing it royally here with that. Do you think you have a, a, a slightly better sense of, it, at least it is, why journalists do what they do. I don't expect you to agree with it. You know, I hope you might uh, with that. But maybe the next time you get kicked at a reporter, stop for a second and see. All right, were they actually doing something that had a professional uh, as part of their professional duties? And they may not be, but they probably were. It's just not openly apparent to you because your roles in society is indeed different than their role. I'll well, I don't know if this yeah. is a, a last okay. question or not, but I think... Well, I, I have to 11.30, correct? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I think I'm right there now, so okay. can I close off with this last question? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. The, uh, it seems like a lot of what you were talking about uh, really spoke more to tr traditional journalism, you know, newspaper kinds of things. Now, anyone can be a journalist for right. the internet. You know, are they aware of this kind of public professional Probably not. difference? No. If they haven't attended formal uh, journalism program, they probably have no clue of this, which explains why there's a lot of bad journalism by so-called journalists. Um, and that's the sad part, is that you do take on, a, if you're going to assume this role, you have to take on its responsibilities if you're going to truly be part of that group. We wouldn't want a, oh, I'm a doctor now. <laughs> Discount appendectomies. <laughs> Not a good idea. And when we hop online, that's what we're getting, a lot of discount appendectomies. <laughs> Thank you so much. You've been an awesome audience. I appreciate it. <laughs>